It's a pleasure to be with IONS again. This is the fourth time that we've been privileged to meet with you and share some of our ideas. We find you a, a very loving and down-to-earth group, which might be a little bit of an oxymoron because from what I understand, a lot of you really don't want to be here. You'd rather be up there. Uh, to begin with, let me reflect on an experience a few years ago when we were speaking at the Utah Ions. It was a large group that night, over 100 people and many doctors and nurses present. And an interesting thing came from the audience. Uh, as we talked about the uh, near-death experience and then what Sarah and I are going to discuss a little bit with you today, the pre-birth experience, a number of doctors and nurses volunteered this information that when they worked in a room where an individual was dying or an individual was being born, the spirit in that room was the same. It was sacred, it was holy, both at birth and at death. Well, uh, as you heard, we've been married 42 years and we're still friends. And Sarah has exceptional spiritual gifts as many people in this group do. And one of her gifts is she has seen through vision, through hearing, through dreams, five of our nine children before they were conceived. Now, that experience was very meaningful to her, of course, and to me. And one evening, after we had struggled to get our nine children to bed, we discovered that we still had enough energy to talk about a book. She was beginning to get these promptings that she should uh, write some of this down and do a little research and find other people who may have similar experiences. And in the process, we learned about ions. As we studied groups that were uh, looking into spiritual phenomena, uh, we felt that IONS was perhaps the, the most credible of the organizations, and so we joined. And we started a chapter of IONS here in the Phoenix area and ran that for several years. And uh, as we were learning more about near-death experiences, you know, one of the characteristics, one of the traits of a, of a near-death experience is that often people see other beings on the other side. Uh, quite often it might be a deceased grandparent or uh, some other relative. Sometimes it's a being of light that is unknown. Uh, sometimes a being of light that is interpreted to be Christ or God. But there's another type of being that is sometimes seen during a near-death experience that we found was overlooked. And we learned that Paul Perry, a researcher and co-author with uh, Daniel Brinkley, Raymond Moody, Melvin Morris, uh, lived right here in Scottsdale. Well, as we decided that uh, we wanted to start gathering stories and, and put together a book on this phenomena that we call the pre-birth experience, and imagine with me a continuum, and here on, on this end we have pre-earth life, and then we have earth life, and then we have afterlife. Okay, now IONS is focused a lot on afterlife. 
But if you put this continuum together and look at things like what the doctors and nurses said about the two experiences of birth and death, it all kind of flows together. And we've heard that, that idea that everything is connected. Okay, so we know that earth life is finite, but we don't know how far the other ends of that spectrum continue. I think they're eternal. I think that we are eternal beings. Well, <clears throat> we coined the phrase pre-birth experience for individuals like Sarah who had seen or heard from a soul before they were born and in many cases before they were conceived. Well, uh, my father was a veterinarian. Uh, his brother, my uncle, was a dog trainer. And I have seen well-trained hunting dogs go around through, over, under, swim through, whatever they had to do to gain their objective. When Sarah made up her mind that she was going to do this, she became my favorite bird dogger. Uh, this is a humble lady from Tennessee. Uh, she was a school teacher for a short time and then has such a love for motherhood that as our family began to join us, she wanted to be a stay-at-home mommy and that's, that's what she's done and she's done an outstanding job. Uh, was even named Arizona Homemaker of the Year a few years back. Well, <clears throat> she contacted Paul Perry and she said, in your research on near-death experiences, have you ever uh, run across individuals who have seen people waiting to be born or spirits waiting to be born? And his reaction was, Wow, I thought I'd heard every question there was to ask about the near-death experience, but I've never heard that one. Let me look through my files and I'll get back to you. Well, we waited about two weeks and then one day I came home after work and Sarah was so excited. Paul Perry had called back and he said, absolutely, I found a number of near-death experiences where souls waiting to be born were part of the experience, but somehow it didn't really register that this was a separate group of people. Um, well, you know, the, the pre-birth experience is more common than you might think. Did not the angel Gabriel announce to Mary in the Bible that Jesus, the Messiah, was to be born? and a similar experience to Zechariah in the temple about John the Baptist. When we contacted Dr. Kenneth Ring at the University of Connecticut about our research, he responded, oh yes, the announcing dream. Very common in cross-cultural studies. Well, with the limited time that we have, I want to share a couple of those and then I realize I'm the uh, warm-up act here and the star will be following. I'll just take a few more minutes, but think of this. There was an Academy Award nominated movie this last year called 127 Hours about a young man by the name of Aaron Ralston, grew up in the Midwest. His family moved to Colorado when he was in his teens and he became an avid outdoorsman and mountaineer. On a warm afternoon, he went on a hike by himself through Little John Canyon in southern Utah. And as he was going through a very narrow uh, area where there were rocks on both sides, to brace himself, he reached out and pushed against a large boulder weighing an estimated 800 pounds. And it, happened to be in a precarious position. And it shifted as he pushed against it and rolled over on his hand. 
Can you imagine such a freak accident? And he was not warmly dressed because it was a, a warm Sunday, summer afternoon and he had on shorts and a t-shirt, tennis shoes. He had a backpack. He had a little bit of rope with him. He struggled and struggled to move that rock and, and free himself to no avail. Somehow he was able to take the rope that he had and uh, design a little sling. For five days and five nights, he hung in that sling. He had a couple of power bars and a bottle of water. He ended up drinking his own urine to survive. And ironically, it was very warm in the mornings, but very uh, cold in the evening, as low as 35 degrees. And the breeze would blow down through that kind of like a funnel that he was stuck in. And by the fifth night, he had resigned himself to death and he carved an epitaph in the stone, sandstone. Uh, he had his uh, iPhone or whatever with him and he recorded a final message and prepared to die. And as hypothermia set in that night, as these breezes blew down through his shorts and t-shirt, he suddenly went through an opening. Does this sound like a near-death experience? And he went into a room. He saw several things, but in the interest of time, he ended up in this room where sunshine was coming in and it was like dappled spots of light around the floor. And then across the floor, he saw a little redheaded boy. And the boy ran to him and he threw the boy up on his shoulder and he had a stump on one arm. And he realized that this was his unborn son. He whirled around and danced with that boy for a few minutes. And then suddenly he was back freezing in Blue John Canyon. But now he had a new reason to live. And he, he did the absolutely unthinkable. I don't know that I've ever heard of another human being doing what he did next. He resolved <clears throat> to amputate his arm, to free himself and live. And his knife was dull because he'd carved in sandstone. And he realized that there was no way he could cut through the bone. And then he got this idea that if he shifted his weight a certain way, he can kind of throw his body and snap one of the bones and then throw it the other way and snap the other one. So he broke the bones first in his arm and then he started to cut through with a dull knife and when he got to the ligaments they were too tough for the knife and he had, um, oh what do they call that, one of those little multi-tools and he was able to open it with his free hand to the pliers and he literally tore parts of his ligaments off until he was able to completely separate his arm and suddenly he was free. The whole operation took about an hour. Well, he's had very little food, he's dehydrated. He manages to work his way out of the canyon. Oh, and of course he used a tourniquet too. Um, and he gets to a place where there's some stagnant water, he drinks, uh, and then there's a place where he actually has to set up his ropes and repel down with one hand and an amputated arm. Well, <clears throat> eventually he runs into some other hikers and uh, they, they have a cell phone and they 
they call 911 and a helicopter comes and uh, he's now alive. Now, our uh, laptop is having its own near-death experience. Uh, we had this story told by Aaron Ralston himself about a five-minute segment that we were going to show you. Uh, but that little boy is now born. But isn't it interesting that it was such a phenomenal event that uh, he amputated his own arm and the, that part of the experience just kind of took over and people sort of overlooked, missed the point that the reason he had the courage, the strength, the determination to do that after he had resigned himself to death was he saw his unborn son. Now, when Raymond Moody published Life After Life, uh, he says that he had collected about 150 stories or accounts of uh, that type of experience. Sarah's first book was sort of a mirror image of Life After Life. It was called Life Before Life. And by this time, she had collected about 150 accounts. Now, this started 20 years ago before internet and all this stuff that so, so enhanced communication. But this, this bird dogger of mine, she wrote editors of newspapers around the country and over in England and Ireland and uh, Australia and explained what she was looking for. Well, we didn't hear anything for a few weeks and kind of wondered, is this going to work? And then the first phone call, and then a letter, and the story started to come in. And now, of course, most come in by email. Uh, Sarah's website, sarahhines.org, or .com, .com. And you've got to take the E out of the middle on Heinz and stick it on the end. We're not part of the ketchup group. If we were, we'd invite y'all out on the yacht after the conference. Okay, um, I'm going to give the balance of the time to Sarah, but let me just tell you a little bit. Uh, you know, I have a, a doctorate in psychology, and actually my office is just a few blocks from here. Um, we've lived in Arizona now for this our 26th year, but. Uh, one day when Sarah was uh, preparing her second book, uh, you know, psychologists were supposed to analyze, so I said, hey, why don't you let me analyze some of your data? So I took 57 stories that she was considering for publication at that time, and I went through them, starting with just a blank sheet of paper. And every time I read something, I thought, now there's a point, there's a concept. I would write it down, and then every time I would find in another story uh, something similar to that, I would put a mark. So when I got done, let me just share with you quickly a little bit of what I learned about this data. 53% uh, of that sample of pre-birth experiences, uh, they occurred before conception, leaving 47% after conception but before the child was born. 63% uh, came to mothers, almost two-thirds, 13% to fathers, you know, mothers should get the majority, they do the work. Parents uh, were 76%, but grandparents, siblings, other relatives, close friends, and even midwives had had visions or heard voices of the unborn. And, uh, Sometimes they announce their name. Two of our children told us before they were born they wanted to be called Matthew and Becky, and so on. Um, our sample at that time, 44 occurred in the United States, but we also had representation from Australia, England, Canada, the Navajo Indian, and Blackfoot Indian nations. And since that time, we have added Africa, Israel, Japan, Russia, and New Zealand. 
we, th we hypothesize this is a universal experience, just like the near-death experience is. Uh, Pre-birth experiences occur in visions or visitations, dreams, by hearing, through telepathy, telepathic communication, just like in a near-death experience. 29 of our sample of 57 had escorts bringing them to Earth, just like many people when they have a near-death experience, an escort meets them or they have a guide. Uh, three occurred through adoption. It was known ahead of time that the adoptive parents would be the real parents to this person. Uh, and some people have deja vu memories or flashbacks of heaven before they came down. Two people remembered speaking a different language in heaven. Um, and 10 reported seeing a brilliant light during their pre-birth experience. Now, if you compare the uh, PBE, the pre-birth experience, and the NDE, <clears throat> We'll just touch briefly on this, um, and, and I'll be done. Here are 10 elements that I found in that sample of almost 60 pre-birth experiences. You know the love that is talked about in a near-death experience, almost ineffable. Almost everybody reports it that way. Uh, Evan did this morning, and so on. There is a huge radiation of love coming from these pre-born beings in most of these experiences. Often there is a celestial light associated with the experience, similar to the light in the NDE. These souls are thankful and very eager to come to Earth, but at the same time, they're leaving a loving, safe, heavenly environment or home. And sometimes there's a little trepidation, a little fear about coming down to this cold and dreary. Uh, clearly, there is a time to come to Earth. These things are known ahead of time. Each individual comes with a unique mission or missions. Sometimes they bring messages of protection and warning uh, to the recipient. They almost always bring an escort to Earth. Now, <coughs> with the three or four minutes I have left, um, I w I'd like to share with you, you know, I've got so much material, this is a challenge. Um, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to take an account from uh, Ken Ring's new book. Mm. He speaks of going to a conference on death and dying in uh, Montreal, Canada a few years ago. And <clears throat> there was a panel the last afternoon sitting up on the stage and they had doctors and uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and so on. And then uh, just before they started, this little uh, boy that he estimated around age nine came up with his mother and sat up here, and when they opened the conference, it was announced that he had been kind of a last minute addition to the concluding afternoon of the conference, and uh, he stood up and announced that he was dying of leukemia, and he gave some of his thoughts about dying, and the main point that he made was, those of us who are dying, we would like to be treated like anybody else. We don't, we don't want to stand out and be treated differently. Well, <clears throat> then he sat back and uh, Ken says that he was, he just kind of attracted your attention. There was sort of an aura about him. But he put on, he was a French speaker in Canada and he put on his earphones to hear the translations and just sat there for almost three hours with his mother. And as they were concluding, they were asking some questions about <clears throat> different aspects of uh, approaching death and the near-death experience. And someone in the audience suddenly thought to ask little Mark what he thought about it. 
Well, it sort of brought him up uh, startled. But <clears throat> he said, and this is the English translation that Ken uh, wrote down. I think when you die, it's not over. It can't be over. Because in my mind, it's just impossible. It continues. We just go back home. And so often in pre-birth experiences and near-death experiences, where we come from and where we return to is referred to as home. This is temporary. <clears throat> we go back home where we were before we were in this life. This is a nine-year-old boy who's dying. And in this life, we have to learn something. And when we learn that thing, then we go back home. We go back where we were before. And this life, of course, is limited to a certain time period. This is exterior life. What an interesting definition. We're all exteriors. But the life that's inside is infinite. It never ends. And then one other thought, a two-month-old two child said to his mother, when you die, it's a tunnel with light that's white. You go to the light. Grandpa was there with a light on his head. That mother wrote to Ken Ring, I thought it was significant that several of your NDEers mentioned a feeling of homecoming, a familiarity a feeling that they had always known everything they experienced. Is it possible that very young children retain some memory of having been there? I think so. Thank you. Well, girls or guys, if you want to do research, I suggest you marry a psychologist. It has lots of perks, and uh, we've had a fun life, and I so appreciate his help and assistance. He really makes the work complete. I just want to express the love we do have for you and what you have taught us about love. Those of you who've been to heaven and back, teach us how to, how to love. You know, I used to hold a lot of things in, but now when I feel love towards someone, I, a stranger, whatever, I tell them. I want to share one of my favorite experiences that I have collected that is a near-death experience where a lady met her future children. And it's interesting, those of you who do your work that you feel God has called you to do, how there is a divine help in, in moving forward with the mission. And that's what's happened to me. I was sitting in a doctor's office and I overheard two ladies talking. And one of them was talking about her near-death experience and how she had seen her four children. Well, I did get her phone number, and, and uh, w this is the story that's quite amazing. Debbie was in an incredibly abusive home, and the abuse had gone on for many generations. <clears throat> when she was five years old, in, in a terrible experience that she had, her spirit just left her body, and she went um, to heaven. She went to a different place. And she said, the sadness I had felt on earth was replaced by calmness and peace. I was wearing a beautiful little dress with white fluffy sleeves, and around me was a large circle of people that had gathered. He's coming. Who, I said. 
they were discussing certain names of who was coming, Messiah, Rabboni, the Savior. And the being of light began to glide toward her and she said she could see into his soul, into eternity. And he said to me, your body has died too soon. You're not intended to be here yet. You have not yet completed your mission on the earth. His kind words touched me as a little five-year-old girl. I can't go back. I want to stay here with you. He said, you did nothing wrong. You are innocent. You need to raise your children. That didn't make any sense. I didn't have any kids. I was only five years old. He responded with persistence as a loving parent. That's why you need to return. She said that he then brought in four beautiful beings of light. And she knew that those were her four children. Each of those beings of light were different. The leader of the group, the firstborn, was tall and slender, bright, serious, handsome, intent. The second was also male. He was slighter than the first, but only in size. And he had a twinkle in his eye. The third was a girl, very feminine and graceful. And her very movement implied song and dance. And the fourth one was smaller, and she just hugged me and would not let go. They communicated to Debbie that they had chosen her as their mother. She said, someone else can be your mother. It doesn't need to be me. And, but they insisted, and they wanted only me. And if I didn't go back, it would frustrate their plans. I couldn't dissuade them. I couldn't change their mind. And as the children began to encourage her, those four magnificent beings, I could not deny them. And she asked the, the magnificent being of light, is there no other way? And he said, not if you want to fulfill the commitments you made with your children and with others before you were born. And so with the insistence of the children, she returned and later became the mother of those four children. She said, these children are the spirits that I met when I was five years old. They are the light and joy of my life. And also, Debbie was a chain breaker. She learned that on the other side. Many special spirits at this time on the earth are here to break traditions of ancestors. Great traditions that are harsh and and that are disturbing to life and that may cause a lot of sadness and pain, such as addictions. Many of us are here to break those chains that in some way our ancestral line can have it broken for them. And some of you may know that you're chain breakers. I know that I'm a chain breaker. Brent knows that he's a chain breaker. We've had to work a lot <laughs> to overcome many of our issues that would desire to hold us back from progressing. Well, as Brent said, I am an experiencer in that as a five-year-old child, I had spontaneous out-of-body experiences. I've had a chance to write my story and it will be uh, it will be out in a few months but I 
I realized as I look back on this experience that I had as a child that it had really given me an opportunity to gain my gifts because going into the light even at an age of five years old would, would make a difference. Now I had an interesting illness as a child. Um, I call it homesick for heaven. <laughs> and I felt like God had dropped me off at a bus stop and had forgotten to pick me up. And at age five, we think deeply. And as, as the Bible says, we are strangers and pilgrims here on the earth. I knew it. And I wanted to get back to him. And in some way, I do not know how, I would have spontaneous out-of-body experiences. But I would only get to the ceiling. I, I knew I had to go east, but I couldn't get any further. But I would look down at my little body, and I knew that that was my body. I was a child, but my spirit self, I knew that I had a, a maturity. I knew that I had something that was, I didn't know the word eternal then, but, but I knew that I was much more than that little five-year-old body. But I did it several times, and there came a point where I was out of body, I was floating like a balloon <laughs> up at the ceiling, and I heard a male voice say, you get back in your body and don't you ever do that again. Well, it was, it was a voice from the unseen world. I don't know who it was, but it was a voice of authority. And I went back in my body, and I did not do it again. I, I think that we all come to earth yearning for relationships that complete us. And it was that yearning for something that took me at the age of 19 to the Rocky Mountain West. And I had an opportunity to go to school there and I had a feeling I was going to meet my husband within a few days. And one day I was walking out of the education building, Brent was walking in and our arms touched and I had a, a voice in my mind say, there goes the man you will someday marry. I met him a few weeks later and we began to date and one evening when we were returning from a date, we had parked in front of my apartment which looked out over the beautiful valley. And Brent had asked if we could have a prayer to thank, each, to thank God for bringing us together. And while I was listening to him pray, I began to hear music very faintly at first, but it began to get stronger. And it was a choir, it was like a heavenly choir. And the voices began to grow stronger and stronger. Now my roommates were not inclined to listen to choir music, especially at midnight. And there was no way that it could be them. But then as as knowledge began to grow within me, I realized this was a choir of angels that I was hearing. And they were rejoicing that we were together. Heaven was rejoicing. I didn't understand who those angels were until a year after we were married. I was told by doctors that I would never be able to have children. When I told Brent after we were engaged, he said, I'll take care of that, which always gives me goosebumps. <laughs> and so nine months and two weeks later, I delivered our daughter after our wedding day. 
And a few weeks later, I was holding this beautiful child that I never thought I would ever have a child. I was holding this beautiful baby. You know, it was late at night when the mother is with the child, and it's a quiet, it's a sacred time. And I looked at her, and I realized that within that choir of angels was this daughter, this baby, Krista. She knew I was going to be her mother. She knew Brent was going to be her father. She had chosen us, and I had been privileged to hear her, and I believe our other children, maybe our grandchildren, who knows. But I had been privileged to hear her in that choir, rejoicing that we were together. The power of relationships, as you speak, as we learn from the other side, is something that we can take with us, that and knowledge. I learned that in our experiences on the earth, there are angels that can be near us so many times and so many ways. One of the most profound pre-birth experiences that I had was with my fifth pregnancy. I, I'd had a miscarriage, and I was sorrowful about that. And I had a dream, and I was shown that this beautiful, mature, spirit, this woman that had come to me before and said that she was coming to our home, she told me that she would be returning. And so I conceived again and saw a beautiful, actually it was beautiful to me, it was a hospital room. <laughs> But it was an unusual room. It was very long and narrow, and, and I saw where the, how the bed was set up, the window, the television. And in the dream, the nurse came and placed a little bundle, a little baby, in my arms. And a voice announced, um, here is your daughter, Sarah Rebecca. Well, I conceived again, but then threatened another miscarriage. And so I did what some of the speakers have discussed, the power of meditation, the power of prayer. I was so intent to get through to heaven that I did not kneel. I went totally on the floor to pour out my heart to God, to pray that he would protect this child that was on her second attempt to come. And I had a vision. I saw my spirit self leaving my heavenly home. I saw the brilliance of the place where God lives. I saw the flames and the fire of the eternal burnings. And I was leaving it as I prepared to return to go to earth, and I was very sad to leave home. I was sad to leave a place where I was loved unconditionally. But, as I, but I knew that I had been trained and taught for eons of time to come to earth. I knew that I had work to do here. I knew it was like going away to college. I knew that I had chosen my trials and my tests. But I became so frightened as I looked down and I saw the earth remote and distant and dark. An escort came and appeared by my side. And I said to him, I never knew the earth was so far away from home. And he said, yes, it is 
Indeed, it is a great distance. And then I awoke. I, I, the vision ended, and I, I felt a comforting presence enter my bedroom. And I stood, feeling a heavenly presence there. I felt immersed in a great being of love. And he said to me, I am the great physician. I will heal your body. And this child will come forth whole and well, for I have so decreed it. With that experience, I laid down on my bed, felt comforted, and I did begin to heal. I went to my doctor the next day and everything was good. The baby was intact. A few months later, of course, for many of us women, we always go to the hospital on a cold, dark, rainy night. That's what I usually did at 4 a.m. And <laughs> so, of course, Brent was, was driving me to the hospital. And I saw our daughter. <laughs> Again, she was reluctant to come. And so I began to pray, what am I going to do? Please help this child to come to earth safely. When we arrived at the hospital and that moment of delivery was near. In my spirit eyes, in my spiritual mind, words are hard to use and to explain. I saw a being of light standing by my bed, and he said, I have personally escorted this child to the earth. And our Sarah Rebecca was born. She had a hard time getting here. It wasn't easy for her. It wasn't easy for me. But she's still here, thank goodness. She's a beautiful mother of three little children, and I was just with her yesterday. She's my little petite one. She fits under my armpit <laughs> and is a beautiful and wonderful daughter. These children are very special children. They have work to do. And so as they come to our children or to our grandchildren or to us, we need to offer love and support as best we can. I had a very special experience with a child that we, we miscarried. Um, about, well, I'm thinking about 15 years ago. Uh, and this was a miscarriage that was difficult, and women know how that goes. And several years later, when Brent and I were working on one of our books, Brent read to me the most beautiful words that he had written. And I said in my mind, I wonder who helped him write those words. And then somehow, usually my spiritual eyes, you know, we, how we see with our spiritual eyes and it's difficult to explain how that happens. But this time I saw with my natural eyes, I saw a handsome young man standing behind Brent. He had his shoulders, his hands on Brent's shoulders as Brent was sitting at the computer. And he looked at me and he told me how much he loves his dad. This was our son, Daniel, that I had miscarried. Daniel told me that he 
His mission was never to stay on the earth. But he came for a few months and lived as his little body grew under my heart. For him, he said that was all he needed. He said that he had been given permission to leave me early because if he had been born, as he may have been, his mission was never to stay and he would have been called home very early as a baby. But because he knew that would have been so hard on me, he had permission to leave early. But that his work is to be a guardian angel for our family, for our mission as writers, for a voice to speak on behalf of the children that are waiting to be born. After Sarah Rebecca was here, I, this little child was so special and sometimes we have children that when they wake up from their nap, they don't cry but they coo and they sing. <laughs> And this was Sarah Rebecca. Some of the children would tease, we would tease each other that there were angels in her room and she was singing to the angels. Well, one day I opened, I opened the nursery door um, with care, almost with a sense of reverence, listening to her beautiful voice singing, a little nine-month-old baby. And I walked into this sacred nursery, and I heard a voice, and the voice said, my name is Matthew, and I need to come to your home. Well, Matthew did come, but I learned that what was happening with Becky is that she was entertaining angels. It was her unborn brother. And she was probably talking to him in her celestial language of cooing and speaking however she could speak. But she was so overjoyed to see her brother Matthew. And Matthew was able to get through to me and to announce that he was ready to come. And so he did. He came along about a year later. And those two little children had a beauty in play that I don't think any of my other children had together. And I think it was because of their association together, one on earth and one in heaven. I have learned that many great poets have, have written about this concept. One of my favorites is William Wordsworth, Ode on Intimations of Immortality. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us our life star hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar, not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. And in speaking of relationships and the experiences that we feel with our children and those we love, those friends that we meet here on the earth and those we love, I also found a beautiful quote that I think explains that. 
because there's th there are things that we know, there are things that we feel, certain music, certain people. We don't know how to explain why we feel that connection. We just know it's there. Sometimes during solitude, I hear truth spoken with clarity and freshness. Uncolored and untranslated, it speaks from within myself in a language original, but inarticulate, heard only with a soul, and I realized I brought it with me, was never taught it, nor can I effectively teach it to another. We are eternal beings. We are here to do a work. We have to follow those passions because through following those passions to do good, whatever we care to give to the world, whether it to bring love to a child or to do anything else of any proportion, that's one of the reasons we were born. And it will bring us happiness and we will raise others to find their true potential as children of God. Thank you.